Greetings in the name of Christ. I'm Walter Meyer III. We'll be going through the Gospel reading for Proper 25, Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 to 46. First of all, we will go through the Greek, and then I'll have some exegetical commentary by way of background for a sermon. So first of all, going through the Greek. And for the most part, I'll be translating, but I'll also be commenting in particular on certain Greek words. And the Pharisees, hearing that, and then we have this verb here, ephemosin, from the verbal root phimoo, which means to put to silence or to muzzle. That he had put to silence or muzzled the Sadducees, and the subject of that verb is Jesus. So, and the Pharisees, hearing that he, namely Jesus, had put to silence the Sadducees, gathered together to the same place. You could simply say they were gathered together. All right, going on to verse 35. And then we go a little bit further in the verse to get the subject. One of them. And then we read that this man was a nomikos. In other words, a lawyer. And this was a man learned in the law of Moses. And so he was a scribe belonging to the Pharisaic party. And one of them, a lawyer, asked, and then we have this verb, peratzon, uh, testing him or even tempting him. And the him here is Jesus. Verse 36, didaskle, teacher. And then going in a literal fashion with the next portion of that verse, which law and to lay is great in the law, or which commandment is great in the law. Now we could put that also this way, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Verse 37, and he, namely Jesus, said to him, and now the quotation from Jesus. You shall love the Lord your God with your whole heart and with your whole soul and with your whole understanding, or that could also be understood as mind. Verse 38. This is the great and first commandment. Verse 39, the second and the second is like to it, is similar to it. And then Jesus says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 40, on these two commandments, so we have these and then two, and then commandments. The whole law, so holos honomos, the whole law, and then we have this verb here, kremanumi, and this is a present tense, hangs. So literally it means hangs. So the whole law hangs and the prophets. Of course, the reference here is to the Old Testament, which could be referred to as the Law and the Prophets, uh, the two great sections. So again, verse 40, just to repeat this. On these two commandments, the whole law hangs and the prophets. Verse 41. Now we notice the genitives at the beginning of this verse, and this is because of the time. This is a temporal clause. And in this context, we can use the nuance while. And while the Pharisees were gathered together, he asked them. So the subject is Jesus. Jesus asked them, and we have 
Jesus here at the following point, position here. Jesus asked them, and then verse 42, saying, uh, literally, what does it seem to you? Uh, what do you think concerning the Christ? And of course, reference to Christos, that's a reference to the Messiah. Of whom is he son? And then going to the next portion of verse 42, they say to him, and please scroll up. And so their answer would be this, of David. So Jesus says, of whom is he son? They say to him, of David. Verse 43, he says to them. Okay, how therefore does David in the Spirit, uh, this would be a reference to the Holy Spirit and David being under inspiration. And David then uttering this prophecy by the Holy Spirit. How therefore does David in the Spirit call him Lord, saying, and then verse 44, uh, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right until, and then we have this verb tho, the verb tithemi. This is an aorist subjunctive. Until I set or place your enemies, and so we have the su here, your enemies, and then hupakato, under your feet. Verse 45. If therefore David calls him Lord, how is he his son? How is he his son? Verse 46. And no one was able to answer him a word, nor did anyone dare. Here we have the verb talmao, and this is an heiress. Nor did anyone dare from that day to ask him anything. Of course, it's really you know, nothing, but putting it into good English idiom, anything. So once again, nor did anyone dare from that day to ask him anything. All right, thus far the text by way of the Greek. And now a few thoughts concerning exegesis by way of preparing for a sermon. The background for our text is a dramatic back and forth interchange between Jesus and those who opposed him, namely the chief priests, Sadducees, and Pharisees. And these opponents have been asking Jesus questions and listening very closely to his answers to see if they could trap him in his words or prove that he couldn't answer their questions. But of course, Jesus always gave just the right answer, a brilliant response, and they were stunned. And now Jesus turns the tables on them, specifically on the Pharisees, by asking them a question. And that is now our text. We're looking especially at verses 41 through 46. Now a key point which comes through in Jesus' words and in his quoting of Psalm 110, 110 verse 1, is that the Messiah, the Savior promised in the Old Testament, is David's son and Lord. Now the Messiah was and is a man. So when Jesus says to them, what do you think about the Christ? What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? The Pharisees immediately answer, the son of David. And they were right. The Old Testament revealed that the Messiah would be a human being and that he would, yes, be a descendant of David. But their answer was incomplete. It was right as far as it went, but more needed to be said. And that's why Jesus then refers to Psalm 110, verse 1. He wants to bring them to a fuller understanding of the Messiah. 
And so referring to that verse in the psalm, Jesus quotes this verse, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. Now, the Pharisees realized that this psalm was a prophecy concerning the Messiah. Of that, there was no debate. And they also understood that the phrase, the Lord said to my Lord, was a reference to the Almighty God speaking to the Messiah. And now the final point that Jesus is trying to get them to see and admit, and admit is that the Messiah himself would be God. For David, the greatest king in the history of Israel, calls this Messiah, my Lord. And so that's an indication that the Messiah would not only be a descendant of David, he would be far greater than David. He would be, in fact, very God, the Son of God. And we know that the Messiah had to be both man and God in order to be the savior of the world, in order to be the substitute for the human race to redeem all people from their sins and open up for them the way of salvation. Now, the Pharisees and the other enemies of Jesus did not have this proper understanding of the Messiah. For them, the Messiah would be a deliverer from the Romans. And he would set up then an earthly kingdom as David had done. That's what they looked forward to in the Messiah. But only a man was needed for that kind of deliverance. David had done this. We can also think of Alexander the Great setting up a large empire. Tied in with their wrong conception of the Messiah was an inadequate realization on their part of their own sin and a misunderstanding of the way of salvation. They thought that they would be saved by their own merit, by their own works. Deliverance from the Romans, yes, they needed that. Deliverance from their sins, no, not necessary. They could take care of that themselves. Therefore, the Pharisees refused to admit that the Messiah, who would be a man, would also be God. To do so meant that their conception of the Messiah was wrong, that they would have to give up their dreams of an earthly kingdom, and that they would also have to admit that atonement had to be made for their sins. God had to do that. So Psalm 110 made clear that the Messiah would be God. They knew that there was no arguing that point. But still, in the hardness of their hearts, they refused to admit the deity of the Messiah. So when Jesus, in, in an ironic turning around of his previous question, asks, if David then calls him Lord, how can he be his son? The Pharisees were in a dilemma. None of them could answer Jesus. Now, as you develop your sermon, you can, of course, present to the people the great joy, the gospel good news that the Messiah is both man and God and what that means for us and the certainty that it gives to us. And as you carry out your exegesis of the text, also bring in toward the end that this prophecy in Psalm 110 verse 1 goes all the way to judgment day when finally God the Father will put all enemies totally, completely under the feet of Jesus, including Satan, who will be stripped completely of his power, including that last enemy, death. That last enemy will also be defeated with the glorious resurrection of the believers on the last day. God's blessings to you, and may he guide you and help you in your exposition of the text for the good of your people, for the good of the church. The Lord be with you.